the brain gets all excited and it releases all the dopamine that we would normally get when we actually went after our goals. Now, dopamine is the reward chemical, so the feel-good motivating chemical that gives us the energy to go after our goals. Talking about your goals out loud actually gives you that energy, gives you that dopamine. So you get the reward without having to do the effort. What does it take to do the impossible? What does it take to level up your game like never before? What does it take for individuals, for organizations, for even institutions to achieve paradigm shifting? Nothing is ever the same again. Breakthroughs. Our mission is to decode the neurobiology of flow and cognitive peak performance. Access the minds of maverick scientists, groundbreaking innovators, and world-leading experts to understand what it takes to achieve ultimate human performance. So you can feel your best, perform your best, and accomplish your boldest goals. I'm your host, Rian Doris, and together with best-selling author Stephen Kotler, I present to you Flow Research Collective Radio. Hey folks, good to see you all. Welcome to today's Crowdcast with Mr. Stephen Kotler and myself. First off, I actually want to say happy 2022. That is the theme of this. It is January 31st. Uh, lots of our clients, lots of folks within the collective were redoing their, their goals, reflecting on 2021, setting things up and intending on building new habits, achieving new goals uh, and planning 2022. And people were saying that they got out the gate really well, first two weeks of 2022, lots of momentum, and then there's a bit of a dip off that tends to happen. I wanted to start off by asking you about something that people love hearing you talk about that you hate talking about, because it's always fun to do. Uh, and it relates to your personal experience with a few of these topics right now. So I wanted to actually start by asking you, Stephen, if there's any behaviors that you're trying to change or failures you've recently experienced uh, and if so, what some of the key lessons are from your own process that, you know, have been insightful or that may be useful to people with respect to your own goals or habits or behaviors? We'll start there. So goal one for this year is to talk less. How's that going? <laughs> <laughs> That's the one that was gone three days in. Yeah, um, exactly. Listen more, talk less. By lunchtime. Um, by lunchtime. <laughs> Every year I set that goal. Every year I fail on that goal. Um, no, I actually, I've been thinking about this a lot because uh, I've been working on very big environmental projects over the past six to nine months. Uh, I've been doing a lot of work around forest health and you know preventing catastrophic wildfire in the American West. And you know this is sort of 30 years of trying to work on animal rights issues or environmental issues. And... The experience is not all, there's a little bit more momentum this time around, but it's heartbreaking. It's, it's always heartbreaking and it's heartbreaking at a level where you feel like the, you know, the plan is at stake and there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of angst that goes with it. And what I keep thinking is, wow, is the voice in my head loud? Wow, is the monkey mind loud? Wow, can one piece of even like slightly negative to neutral information quickly become a catastrophe. And, you know, if I'm not careful five minutes in, my brain is problem solving for a catastrophe that is non-existent. Mm -hmm. But that, like, that's just where my brain is gonna go. And that's, I mean, I, I think that's sort of always one of the lessons you get. It, you know, it's definitely thought control is one of the core grit skills. And I'm just reminded once again of how easy, if you're not sort of really paying attention all the time, it is for that to get away. I know theoretically with 30,000 hours of meditation, it's supposed to go away permanently. And the voice in my head is supposed to stay silent. I've been meditating on and off for 30 years at this point. I don't know if I'm close, but like it hasn't happened yet for me. So, um, you know, I'm more once again reminded of the level of challenge that that is. What What are some of the things, Stephen, that have helped with that? What has helped actually is a slightly different approach to mindfulness uh, that I've taken. So I'll, over the years, I go back and forth with how I approach mindfulness. 
Um, I, when I first came in, I came in through, I, th I think a lot of people who are interested in science and interested in meditation came in through Tibetan Buddhism, possibly because that was uh, the, the Dalai Lama got so interested in science that, you know, a lot of the research on mindfulness was done with Tibetan Buddhists and a lot of the their meditative ideas have been well translated. But one of the ideas that I picked up recently that I had not heard that I find much more interesting is instead of trying to spend 25 minutes a day or 30 minutes a day in meditation, instead break it up into 31 minute moments where you're trying to maintain it, it, now in the Tibetan tradition, they're going for a certain kind of awareness of awareness, right? They want you to try to get behind perception and be aware that perception is taking place kind of thing. Um, and that's been interesting. So I have always blocked meditation as a, you know, a one thing. And I tend to do it when I recover. So I tend to, at the end of my day, I, I like, I have a sauna practice. I tend to meditate in the sauna and that's what I've done for years so instead, I've been sort of sporadically putting those one minute chunks throughout my day uh, and, and practicing that way, which is just very different. And it's interesting. Uh, I don't know if it's getting me farther. I don't know if there's farther to go on this one. Uh, I just find it, uh, it interesting to stop and try to pull back. You know, this is it's usually about, you know, a couple times an hour, basically, if I'm awake during 12 hours pull back a couple times an hour to just sort of watch my mind at work. And I find that useful. And mm -hmm. I find it useful for the exact thing I spoke about earlier, which is I've got a great problem solving brain. It's tremendous. It's a superpower, except one of the things a problem solving brain likes to do is like, it'll take something that's small. And if I'm not paying attention, it's going to turn it into something big and start puzzling out worst case scenarios. And it's been interesting to watch that and been interesting to sort of force myself to continuously say, is this true? Is my brain telling me the truth about this particular situation? And I found myself asking that fairly, fairly frequently. And I don't know where it's leading. I sort of feel like, you know, this is a little bit of, of an adventure that I'm having on in 2022. But that's some of the stuff I've been thinking about and, and playing with personally. That's interesting. Yeah, I've seen research and I don't know how... Um conclusive it is that has shown that shorter more frequent sporadic use of mindfulness increases dispositional trait based mindfulness more than less frequent blocks of mindfulness like the conventional 20 minutes a day yeah in some ways it's an easier habit to develop as well but you know dropping into a quick little bit of mindfulness between calls or when you're in a queue or a line uh, versus trying to do the 20 minute block first thing in the morning. So definitely something worth worth checking out for people. Uh, just to stick on the, the personal topic for another couple of minutes, Stephen, that before we jumped on here, you and I were actually both, uh, we were talking about injury and, and you and I have actually both been injured for a, a while this year or last year leading into this year, uh, which is which has reduced um, both of our ability actually to exercise. And that's usually our number one thing or one of the number one things for peak performance as an ongoing habit. Uh, I'm curious how you have dealt with being able to exercise less, um, what impact that has had, and if there's any um, yeah, any takeaways or, or lessons that you've got for people on that topic. It's a, an easy one. When you use exercise to reset your physiology, and I, you know, I, I love exercise as a way to reset my nervous system, and it, you know, I always say the things that I like best in peak performance are things that work like ice, right? Ice works 100% of the time. You put it on, leg gets cold, inflammation goes down. Now, there you can have an argument about whether or not ice is the right treatment. And there's that camp in the biohacking crowd, but let's ignore that for a second. I just like things that are that reliable. I have found that because I've been injured, and I've been I've been healing and I keep one of the things that, that I love about the injury and I hate about the injury is, yes, I have to exercise. Yes. One of the reasons I've been doubling down on meditation and mindfulness is because I'm getting less physical exercise, which means I have less control of my nervous system. So I have to double down on uh, on other tools. I have also, you know, part of my exercise. Normally I will hike every day. I've still been walking outside because I still want the exposure to nature. Right. Because that is normally really calming for your nervous system as well. 
So I'm making sure that like the things that come to me with exercise being outside often, I'm still doing. It's, you know, it's obviously forced me to double down on other ways of regulating my nervous system. And where I've sort of used it as peak performance training is patience has always been one of my great weaknesses. I have one speed. I like, you know, I like to go a million miles an hour. And one of the main reasons I'm probably still injured is I keep getting myself almost to the edge of heel, getting impatient and getting after it again and sort of re hurting myself. And this is not a new cycle. This is a pretty old cycle. So I'm, I'm using it as a way to sort of train myself into more patience than I've normally had. What about you? Well, just on that point, yeah, that, that makes me think of the go slow to go fast piece. Uh, and I, I do the exact same thing and it's, it's maddening, which is, uh, yeah, as soon as I'm almost better, the instinct is so intense to go back to a 10 out of 10 level of exertion that it resets you again backwards. And in the grand scheme of things, you end up you know, further behind. So go slow to go fast, I think is an important point on that. What I've, what I've found most helpful is um, trying to, as you said, do things. I, I like the point around do things that are like ice, do things that are guaranteed to create some shift in your physiology. For me, what I find very, very useful is, is breath work. I, I find it more reliable in terms of a shift than meditation. I've been doing a lot of, of foam rolling and myofascial release, which kind of makes my body feel like it's exercised, even if I haven't. So I found that helpful and massage as well. And then hot and cold exposure as well, I I find really useful. They don't quite get you the same anandamide dump that exercise does, but but useful as well Um, and and helpful to accelerate recovery. So uh, I wanna switch for a second here to, to goal setting. And one of the big things that, you know, people really wanna hear about is how to, how to not flake on new intentions for the for the new year. And um, I'm gonna just read out a quick passage from The Art of Impossible here about keeping your word to yourself. So you said, most importantly, this rule always applies to goal setting. If you consistently break your word to yourself, once you set a goal, your brain immediately starts hunting for an easy way out. Meaning if you don't keep your word to yourself, your brain moves into I quit mode long before you've even gotten into the game. So I'm curious what your advice is to folks around uh, keeping their word to themselves and how that impacts uh, behavior change and, and goal attainment over the, over the longer term. Some of it's about self-confidence, right? If you start with the idea that flow states have triggers and the challenge skills balance is flow's most important trigger, meaning we pay the most attention to the present moment when the challenge at hand slightly exceeds our skill set, right? So you want to stretch but not snap. When we're paying that kind of focus, it tends to drive dopamine, tends to drive us into flow. Now, the question is, well, what creates challenge and skills? Like, how do we set that level? And how does the brain do it? Because it happens at a very unconscious level. One of the keys is self-confidence. In fact, uh, Susan Jackson, I believe this study is in Flow and Sports, the book she wrote with uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. Uh, Susan Jackson is a sports psychologist uh, who did a lot of early work on flow uh, at the University of Chicago and is now in Australia, still doing great work on flow. And she, in her work, they found among athletes, 81% of what could be meant by like the challenge, where do, how high, how great is this challenge and what are my skills? 81% was actually about self-confidence and less than 19% was actually the skills you're bringing to the challenge. So in certain scenarios, confidence plays a huge role. What creates confidence? One of the things that happens is in goal setting, as you pointed out, if you always break your goals, right? If you always, if you never keep your word to yourself, you have no confidence in yourself, right? This is why your brain starts looking for an easy way out. If you never break your word to yourself, meaning that you never create a goal for yourself that you don't put everything into, don't go after with everything, never back off, don't stop until it's done, then your brain, even if you set an impossibly hard, challenging goal, your brain just keeps problem solving. If it thinks, oh, wow, you never quit, quitting is not an option, it will keep problem solving 
your way towards that solution, which is one of the things you're probably going to need to get to any high, hard goal. So that's, that's first and foremost. And what I mean by keeping your word to yourself, I don't set a goal, meaning I don't write it down in a, in a notebook, in a goal setting notebook, or say it out loud to anybody else if I do not intend to accomplish it. And what do I mean by that? In my mind, everybody's a little different, but when I set a goal, it usually means I'm going to work on it for an, for an hour a day until the problem is solved. Like I will just keep going if, and I just keep going. Now, obviously there are certain times when you want to back off and you want to say, okay, this is, this is a bad idea. I'm going towards something that, you know, it turns out I shouldn't be going towards or it's not going to work that way. And I need to regroup. There are those situations, but as a general rule, if I say it out loud, if I call it a goal, I don't stop until it's done. And so if it goes onto my clear goals list, my daily clear goals list for the day, I don't stop working for the day until everything on that list is done. If it, you know, et cetera, et cetera, high hard goals or, or massively transforming purposes, I just think of it that way. And I'm very, very, very cautious to not talk about my goals out loud. This is a, this is, I talk about this in Art Impossible. I've talked about this a lot out loud and in public. And I think it's really important, especially uh, Gen X is a little different, but when you get into uh, millennial, the millennial generation and, and younger, I see this happening very frequently people sort of lead with their goals hi i'm i'm jack i'm here to save the world or whatever it is or and it turns out that when we talk about our goals the brain gets all excited and it releases all the dopamine that we would normally get when we actually went after our goals now dopamine is the reward chemical it's the feel-good motivating chemical that gives us the energy to go after our goals talking about your goals out loud actually gives you that energy gives you that dopamine so you get the reward without having to do the effort without having to do the work and you and you and you then trying to get like up for the hard fight of oh i got to go after this goal now it's twice as hard right you're still as far away from the goal as you were and all the kind of motivating neurochemical boost that you could use to get towards that goal has already been exploded and worse since dopamine is such a big driver of flow you're now going to have a harder time getting into flow along the way so there's a lot of penalties for talking about your goals out loud rather than putting them on a list and keeping them to yourself and just working on them until they're done and that also means um i try to set goals that i can accomplished that are that are you know what i mean i do set impossible goals i have massively transformative purposes but those are more about process goals like what i'm running how am i going to do this today what am i going to do tomorrow um i don't tend to set huge impossible outcome goals very often um because i won't i won't quit until it's done kind of thing summarize it as uh, avoiding premature dopamine release. I mean, it's interesting. It makes me think about one of the major problems that cocaine addicts end up running into, which is that they end up getting the, the physiological feeling of winning or of accomplishment without actually doing anything that justifies the winning. And you can kind of you simulate that, obviously, to a much more minor degree by yabbering on about your goals with you know, yes yeah, so there's, there's an inverse we i know we're on goal setting and we're going to get to grit but there's a grit point here that's sort of just the same which is one of the things one of the secrets to to becoming gritty to really developing that trait is you don't want to link sort of uh you want to link your dopamine with the act of being persistent you want to get the reward for being persistent. You often, this is why uh, Dr. Andrew Eberman talks about this a little bit too. You want to periodicize reward. So if you're in a classroom and you're a teacher and you're teaching class, you don't always want to say, oh, great job, Rian. That was a fantastic answer. Sometimes you want to do that. Most of the time you don't and you want to make it random. And the reason is if you constantly link the dopamine to the feeling of, oh, I did something right and I accomplished something, it doesn't end up underpinning the persistence, which is what you want that reward to be linked to. The secret to developing grit is to link your dopamine reward to the act of persistence, 
right? The victory is that you leaned in and you did the, did the hard work. It's not what you accomplish. That's why I said earlier, you want to focus on process goals, not outcome goals. This is the reason. Stephen, I just wanted to ask you if there's, there's any books you recommend on that topic? Uh, the Molecular More, The Motivation Myth. I know there's a lot of books you've read that, that sort of circle that topic. So I'm curious if there's any Yeah, so it's, score. It's, it's interesting because um, there's, it's been a long time since I've read this book and there are probably some factual errors by now because um, it was written a very long time ago or 15 years ago. But uh, Dr. Greg Burns, who is a, a brilliant neuroscientist and, and, a, and a super nice guy who has gotten very famous over the past 15 years for neuroimaging work on dogs. So he's the one who figured out that when you, when, if you think your dog loves you and people who are wondering, does my dog really love you? So he did all the brain imaging work on dogs to figure out that the exact same human love circuits light up in dogs when they look at their they're humans and blah, blah, blah. That's what he's been doing for 15 years. Before that, he worked on dopamine and he worked on satisfaction and he wrote a phenomenal book called Satisfaction. And it's really about, he was part of the team, him, Reed Montague, a handful of others who figured out that dopamine is not a motivational chemical. It's actually a chemical that underpins sort of risk taking and shows up when we exert the effort, take the risk to get the reward, not when we get the reward. This sort of overturned most of what we believe for the latter half of the 20th century. And he wrote a great book on it. And one of the reasons I'm recommending it so much is Greg was also, and this book is an example, one of the handful of neuroscientists when I was first starting out working on flow, there weren't very many neuroscientists. There weren't very many psychologists you could talk to about the neuroscience of flow. Greg was one of them. So he was working on this topic as well. He writes about it in, in satisfaction. I've always really sort of like that book. You can never also, if you want to go, that's a very popular sort of friendly, easy to read book. And I like it. A lot of people like that. The molecule of more, right. That, that, that book is sort of making the rounds these days. Um, but uh, on dopamine, I, you know, Robert Sapolsky's behave remains one of the, you know, it's a thick book. It's dense. It's not a quick read but it's pretty thorough on a lot of these topics. Is the key to keep the goal private and celebrate your win in private? And I just want to clarify that what Stephen is saying is keep the goal private, but celebrating your win post actually achieving the goal publicly is okay. Is that correct, Stephen? It is okay. Uh, the additional point is try to avoid is attaching. You don't want to ride the wind too, too high. Really, this is sort of an overall, I think, peak performance tip in general. Um, all those big wins are neurochemically expensive. And so if you ride it up too high, you're going to deplete a lot of the neurochemicals. You're going to need to feel that again. And if, you know, motivation is about little win after little win after little win after little win, and you want a little bit of that pleasure but you don't want to ride it too much because riding that pleasure out, literally you're exhausting your dopamine supplies. So classic example, I talk about this a lot, James Bond movies. Have you ever seen a James Bond movie? So every time something blows up on the screen, Hollywood is saying, give us your dopamine and give us your norepinephrine. Those are your big focusing chemicals, among other things. If you've seen a James Bond movie, a very common experience this is very exciting for the first 20 minutes. And then like an hour in, you're totally bored and it's really hard to pay attention. The reason is the movie's stolen all your dopamine and your norepinephrine, your reward chemicals, your focusing chemicals. Now they're gone and sort of you're left exhausted sort of what, watching this thing play out. That's a fairly common experience. You can do the same thing by over celebrating your wins. It's the same process. And it, what it ends up doing is reinforcing sort of the wrong. You, you want to celebrate your wins. And I'm, I'm terrible. Uh, my friends often have to remind me to celebrate my wins. My best friend, Michael, uh, who's been my editor for, uh, for 30 years. So he's usually on the phone with me when I get the good news, whatever the good news is. He's often on the phone with me when I get it. And, I'll sort of mention it in past and he'll stop me and be like, dude, it's one thing to not celebrate the wins. It's another thing to pretend that they didn't happen at all. And can we pause to acknowledge what just, right. And so I have taken it the other extreme. Um, 
with with that and you can sort of you can sort of go uh both ways someone was recommending grit by angela duckworth and we've actually had dr duckworth on the podcast before um seem you've got an interesting take on grit that is a little bit distinct from how angela talks about it in that book and i'm, I'm curious if you could break that down for folks uh for sure let's start with the top angela's done phenomenal work on grit uh really really interesting work she when she looks under the hood of grit her definition of grit is the intersection of passion and perseverance and my point has been that is she's accurate she's right but the truth of the matter is if grit is really well, passion is a motivator and grit is what you want when the motivator runs out so a uh, passion is a subset of a particular kind of perseverance that is useful. Um, but there's more to the story in the perseverance story. If you talk to peak performers, and this is sort of what I noticed over the years, and this is research I talk about in the art of impossible. If you talk to actual performers, when you talk about perseverance, they will talk about six different kinds of grit, six different kinds of perseverance and especially in the beginning, as you're getting better at these, they need to be trained independently. They're overlapping in the end and they start coming together. But as skill sets, they need to be trained individually and developed individually because they all are trained slightly differently. So that's, that's the main difference. We can break down the six different kinds of grit next if, if that's useful. I actually, just before we do that, I just want to go into... Um the the three different kinds of goals if you could just mm. give a quick breakdown on those just so people have context there and then we'll, we'll shift into the six different kinds of grit and just to orient everyone yeah three different types of goals six different types of grit and then we'll talk about how to apply both for 2022 okay so when scientists talk about motivation right it's a four-part motivation is a catch-all term it means extrinsic motivation stuff will work hard to get for in the real world money sex fame uh, intrinsic motivation, and we've taught we talk a lot about the the big five intrinsic motivators, which are curiosity, passion, purpose, autonomy, and mastery. And then there's goal setting and grit. These four components make up what psychologists talk about as motivation. When we talk about goal setting, there's a lot of information out there, but what it sort of boils down to is the human brain functions best with three tiers of goals. We need, at the top of the pyramid, we need sort of mission level goals for our lives. Or if you're familiar with the books I've written with Peter Diamandis, uh, Abundance or Bold or Futures Fashion, anything, we talk about a massively transformative purpose. It's actually Salim Ismail's phrase. He was the first person who coined that phrase. Uh, we talk about having a massively transformative purpose to put at the top of your life. So this is the, the top of your goal setting pyramid. And you can have a couple of them and they, they shouldn't be super general, right? I'd like to feed the world as a super general. It's a little too general to be useful for a massively transformative purpose. You want to be a little more specific, you know, I, but it's not that, you know, on my, my own level when it comes to massively transformative purposes, I tend to think that I want to advance flow science and research. I want to write books that have a deep impact and I make, want to make the world a better place for plants, animals, and ecosystems, right? Those tend to be my three mission level goals. Um, I've not met Three is probably the a maximum. I don't necessarily know if you're going to want to have more than that at the top of your stack. But this is like the central focus and point. This is your purpose. I personally couldn't come up with one single purpose. I came up with three. And, you know, after working individually on these individual purposes for, you know, 20, 30 years now, they do start to overlap and come together finally. But it took a while for that to happen. So that's at the top of the stack. Then you need high hard goals that's the middle of the stack so if my mission level goal is to write books that have a giant impact on the world high hard goals the next level down are i want to write a book on intuition or i'd like to write a book on flow or i'd like to write a column for the new york or whatever it is that advances my high hard goal but it's a chunk down you know usually one to five years 
Mucin levels are overarching themes for your lives. Think 10, 20, 30 years. High heart goals are usually of the one to five year uh, level and they should feed directly into your mission level goals. The idea is to get all your goals pointed in the exact same direction. When I talked about earlier, when I said like my mission level goals are process goals, you notice that my mission level goal is to write books that have a large impact in the world. It's not to win a Nobel prize in literature. That's an outcome goal and outside of my control. I can't control my attempt to do that. I do have way more control over trying to write books that have a deep impact in the world. That's something I know how to do. And if I lean in hard enough, I can do that. Underneath your high hard goals, you need daily to-do lists. And we, as, as in flow research, we don't talk about daily to-do lists. We instead talk about clear goals lists. And the reason is flow states have triggers, preconditions that lead to more flow. Clear goals are one of the most important flow triggers. And clear goals are a very specific kind of daily to-do list. When you set a clear goals list, often the problem, and this is this is very much a, this is more Western than Eastern, but especially in Western Western countries, when we say clear goals, people hear goals and they ignore the clear. And the problem is that goals pull your attention. The idea of goals pulls your attention off the present. Clear goals are one of the reasons they're a flow trigger is they help keep our attention focused on the present moment. Clear goals tell your brain what to focus on now and what to focus on next, especially if you've got a clear goals list of the, you know your daily daily goals. Does that make sense so far? That makes that makes total sense. And I actually just want to really quickly answer a question. Can you help an 80-year-old who is still procrastinating? I've tried so many ways, but I've not been able to follow through. I've got at least 25 more years. I love that. And I want them to be productive in uh, sharing my learnings and, and just my quick advice to her based on what Stephen is saying here is to, to use clear goals as a way to minimize procrastination. What you want to do as a general rule, what our clients find useful is to make the goal clearer and clearer and clearer and clearer all the way to the point that the resistance that is causing the procrastination disappears and you feel able to begin the task. So we want to go often very crazy levels of, of clarity and detail, as Stephen is emphasizing there. And that, that helps enormously with procrastination. Usually procrastination is because you're lacking an entry point into the task. Yeah, so I, I procrastination, I always think of a writer's block is sort of procrastination writ large. And one of the most common causes of writer's block is you don't know your starts or your endings. So whatever you're writing, you don't know where you're beginning, and you don't know where you're going. Your brain is a pattern wrecking engine. It's a goal-directed machine, and it does that by through pattern recognition. If you know where you're starting, you know where you're ending, right? You have established a clear goal, very, very clear. Your brain will know how will figure out how to do the rest. It does that as long as you give it enough clarity. And that's why, you know, the other thing about clear goals, so we've been talking about uh, we've been talking a little about clear goals as a flow trigger. And, you know, I've been talking about flows impact on attention and, you, you know, clear goals, helping us keep attention on the present moment. The other thing they do was this is another. So when you want to maximize attention to trigger flow, you can either do it by driving dopamine and norepinephrine into the brain. These are focusing chemicals or lowering cognitive load. Cognitive load is all the crap you're trying to think about at any one time. So when you write a clear goals list, and, and I recommend writing by hand in a notebook um, because of the relationship between handwriting and sort of memory. So when you literally take the time to write, I, I have a calendar, I have an electronic calendar that I share with everybody in the company and my assistant and everybody else. But every morning, as soon as I wake up, the first thing I do is I write out my calendar alongside my clear goals list on a piece of paper because it exports it out of my brain. It lowers cognitive load. This liberates more energy than my brain will then repurpose for paying attention. So this is great in helping you achieve your clear goals as well. You're, ex you're lowering cognitive loads or you're lowering stress levels. You're liberating more energy to pay attention. So greater attention, greater performance, more chances of getting it flow. So clear goals is 
it's what I like to talk about as a multi-tool solution. It's one tool that solves a tremendous amount of problems at once. And the other thing I want to stress here, as we see this again and again, is a lot of the most potent flow triggers are these sort of behavioral, psychological behavioral interventions. And they're incredibly potent, but they just don't sound really sexy out loud. So people hear them and they, they're looking for something whiz bang, a cool technology or some neat gimmick. And instead it's this very simple, practical, easy to use tool. And it produces such extraordinary results as, as you pointed out a second ago. Um, and yet people often skip over it because it's just not sexy enough or cool enough. And yet it's deadly effective. Let me say one more thing that's worth mentioning about how do you figure out how many clear goals to have in a day, right? There's one final component here I don't think we talked about, which is my personal belief, and I think this is a general belief among, among most of the peak performers we, we have the opportunity to work with, you don't want to do something if you can't be great at it. Everything you're going to try to do during the day, you want to be great at. So if that's how many items go on a clear goals list for the day, run an experiment for the next two weeks, vary the number because everybody's day, your days are all going to be a little bit different. I have found for me eight to nine clear goals in a day are the maximum number I can be great at. Now you have to understand that the first clear goals list, clear goal on every list I write is my morning writing session. That session lasts usually three to four hours long. So it's a big chunk of focus and energy and work and time. And it limits what else I can do during the day. But uh, so I've learned with, with that block in place, about nine clear goals in a day is, is what goes on my list. And what I always like to tell people is if it's going to require energy, it's got to go on your clear goals list. So like walking my dog goes on my clear goals list. First of all, because exercise lowers stress, being in nature lowers stress, but it all, it's going to take energy. And it's going to take energy away from the bottom line of the day. It's got to go on the clear goals list, even though walking my dog doesn't exactly feed into my high hard goals and right, you know, anything else it does make the world a little bit better place for animals. My dog at least is happier, but it goes on the list because it's going to take energy. And that's how I think about it. So it's useful. And I think our clients have found this useful also to run a two week to three week experiment in their own life. Set different numbers of clear goals through day and see, you know what I mean? At the end of the day, just sort of look back, rate your day. How much ass did you kick in attacking those goals? And you'll pretty soon come up with a number of how many goals to go on your day. How many goals do you think it is possible for, for someone to focus on at a time in parallel? I have found for myself, I have six ongoing categories of sort of goals that I'm, that I'm willing to set kind of thing. Um, I don't tend to usually set goals in all those categories at once. I gave you my three, you know, but it, six is probably six or seven or eight, like in and around there is sort of the maximum. And what I mean by that is at any given point, writing wise, I'm usually editing a book. I'm usually researching another and I'm usually writing a third in some level, uh, way, shape or form. So like I have three ongoing book projects at, you know, at, at different levels in terms of animal projects, I've always got, you know, two, usually I have the work my wife and I do in our, in, in Rancho de Chihuahua and the Buddy Sue project, our, our, our dog sanctuary work. And then there's one or two larger environmental projects I'm working on in the real world at once. Are those full time? No, but I'm working on them. And then, you know, advancing flow science or research, uh, the good news on that particular one is, you know, we have a hundred people at the Flow Research Collective who who are helping me uh, advance flow science and research these days. So I can be a little more ambitious in my goal setting because I've got a great team around me to help advance those goals. If I didn't, I would usually set same thing, one or two or three at, at once. I don't tend to, uh, I don't like, I would rather set fewer goals and accomplish them, then set more goals and not accomplish them. I tend to not set, I very rarely set goals that I don't think I can accomplish through hard work. I'll stress it, stretch goals. I'll stretch goals that will stretch me to the edge of my ability, 
but I don't, you know, I tend to, I tend to want goals that are, you know, incredibly painful. I got to climb Mount Everest to get there, but I can climb, you know what I mean? It's a mountain. I actually think I can climb or I, you know, need 10 to 15% of luck to get to the top, but not more than that kind of thing. I'll just quickly comment on that question as well. Uh, anecdotally, what we see with a lot of our clients is that the vast majority of them are going a mile wide and an inch deep when it comes to their goals. And usually it's a matter of just honing them in, stripping them back, as Stephen's been emphasizing, and building m more of a singular focus, even if you have multiple goals tightening it up and 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 bringing it into more of a singular focus and then figuring out what the sequencing should be if you do have multiple goals that you want to accomplish usually it's it's just a matter of figuring out the sequencing over the long term uh, and getting that right so that you don't end up going a mile wide and an inch deep on you know a dozen things and not actually moving forward on any of them um Stephen, i just want to close on goals here i just want to leave people with with an action they can do from this. What is the best way for folks who don't have these three levels of goals set up and mapped out? Is there a exercise you recommend people do to, to really set these up? Should they literally do a writing session with a pen and paper afterwards? No, I, well, so, I, so a high hard goal level thing, what I tend to do is to me, what you're looking for is a Christmas tree effect. So once you have your massively transformative goals, you then want to break that down. What are the five steps that will get me to each or the four steps or the six steps or however many it is. That's how you think about your high hard goals and your daily goals or your daily action plans that feed into the, those high hard goals. And that tends to be how I think about it. But I think you definitely want to start with the passion recipe. You want to start at the, at the mission level because once that's, in place, I think the other stuff starts to fall into place. Super, Th thanks Steve for that breakdown. I just wanna comment here. Betsy, Bonnie and uh, Eva are, are just emphasizing the desire for diverse voices. And I would recommend checking out our podcast, Flow Research Collective Radio, where we have a whole wide array um, of diverse voices on, on peak performance and peak performance topics as well. I'll throw the link in the chat for folks too. Um, so Stephen, I just want to transition into, into grit and let's do a breakdown on the six types of grit. I can, if it's useful, run through them and then we can, we can pick where to focus specifically. For sure. So uh, there's the grit to persevere, the grit to control your thoughts, the grit to master fear, the grit to be your best when you're at your worst, the grit to train your weaknesses and the grit to recover. Assuming you are someone who has big goals for 2022 and beyond what is the best starting point with respect to those six levels of grit to get the highest impact immediately Chris, Chris, that's a great question thoughts, that's a great yeah fear, that's a great question whatever my personal opinions are here or you know i think everybody's gonna be a little different on this but i think what has been very very true for our clients and the, and the people we're lucky enough to get to work with is that the grit to recover really matters. Um, and I know I'm sort of starting at the back end of the list, but the way I, the, the way I think about it, so peak performance in general is, is difficult. Uh, being gritty in general is, is difficult and burnout is a ever present problem and lack of flow is an ever present problem. And if you have an, and, and I, I find, especially with peak performance, this may not be true for everybody listening, but for hard charging type A types who are, who are really committed to peak performance, nobody likes to slow down. Nobody, one of the reasons, nobody likes to calm down and recover and over and over and over and over again, an active recovery practice and having the grit to lean into that active recovery practice on a daily basis. And, and this, you know, can mean everything from kind of long walks, Epsom salt baths, restorative yoga, sauna, and a, and a good night's sleep, of course, plus proper food, hydration, and nutrition. That stuff really, really tends to matter. And, and those are grit skills. Those are hard things to do. Uh, especially if you've worked a long day and expended a lot of grit to like go jump into a sauna 
you know, it, it may be a luxury, but maybe you don't have one in your house. You have to go someplace to get into a sun and all those things take extra effort. And it's hard to remember to do that on a regular basis. So I think you want to sort of emphasize the grit to recover as, as a, as a key grit skill, um, also as a, as a key, you know, flow hack skill. Um, somebody mentioned earlier that, you know, cortisol was an ongoing issue. I saw that pop up in the chat and you're not going to, without an active recovery protocol, I don't think you're going to, you're going to win that cortisol battle over time either. So I think the, the grit to recover is, uh, is a great place to start. And it leads nicely from something we were just talking about, because one of the other reasons clear goals and clear goals lists are so important, meaning I have a daily to-do list is I've got nine items on my list or whatever you have, you know, when that ninth item gets checked off, oh, wow, I'm done. I can now recover permission to turn off. And if that becomes your pattern, I've got a clear goals list. I'm going to get everything done. And then I'm, I have the grit to recover that this, this, first of all, it will get you very far towards your goals for the year, right? Because yeah, you're not only accomplished everything on your day, you're recharging the batteries for the next day. And so like, just as a place to start, if you're working, the first level of grit is, is perseverance, right? I always think that the easiest way to train perseverance is this, Cre create a daily to-do list, a daily clear goals list and practice getting all things done and then practice recovering. And I think that two step, and I, we started talking about you want to link dopamine, the pleasure chemical to the perseverance. This is what you want to link your dopamine to is, oh, wow, I've accomplished everything on my clear goals list. And I, I went and sh actively shut it down afterwards. Because again, right, you, if you actively accomplish everything on your clear, clear goals list and then you go out and get drunk and don't sleep well to celebrate, you're not going to be able to sustain that momentum. And what you're really after is momentum and momentum is sort of accomplishing everything on your clear goals list day after day after day. You know, at the, uh, I always like to say that peak performance is nothing more or less than a checklist, right? It's doing everything on your checklist today, doing it again tomorrow, doing it again tomorrow, repeat. It's, you know, not particularly sexy, but it's also not particularly overwhelming. This is accessible to anybody, right? Like think about what, what we're really talking about here is not, that difficult the difficulty is in the repetition and understanding that the all of these things work like compound interest so a little bit today a little bit tomorrow a little bit the next day a little bit the next day and the real results get magnified over time that's really helpful Stephen. thanks for that breakdown i just want to answer arna mayer's question there is there a way to declare cortisol bankruptcy as the mom of two young kids it feels close to impossible to prioritize restoration and uh, to build on that question Stephen, i'm curious if you could just describe your concept of multi-tool solutions and how that may be useful to add recovery to things that arna may be already doing so that it doesn't actually yeah take time first of all uh Shout out to moms because peak performance with kids is especially difficult. There's, there's, there's no way around. We kids can be an incredibly joyful, flowy part of our lives, but um, there, there's a lot to juggle and certainly difficult. Um, so first of all, that is, is worth acknowledging that. Uh, and what Rian was talking about is I like to look for, because I, I, Peak performers in general are, are very, very busy. So I like to stack protocols. So look for ways to do a couple things together. I gave an example of this very early on when I said I like in when I do my active recovery protocol at the end of my days, I like to tr go into a sauna and I like to do breath work inside the sauna. So saunas themselves or epsom salt bath for example sweating saunas are particularly good automatically lower cortisol levels so you don't have to do any work you add in breath work you take it even farther um so this is a way to stack protocols so you're doing two or three things at once um which is very very useful uh, the other thing i'd like to talk about with Anna for half a second is where we started uh because i've uh the micro meditations, the one minute meditations throughout a day, uh, I have been having a lot of conversation uh, with moms 
actually recently about uh i don't think there's a way peak performance for for mothers um is is so difficult i don't think there are there's anything hard and fast but it's been an ongoing conversation and one of the things that has come up lately in these conversations that i've had is these kind of micro mindfulness moments of of one minute of clarity and non-reactivity the micro recoveries built in throughout the day if you can't get one big macro recovery and a multi-tool solution is a single problem single tool that solves multiple problems at once mindfulness is a is a is a classic example i think that's one of the examples i give in the art of impossible because it trains up focus which amplifies flow and it trains up emotional regulation at the same time which keeps you more even even keel and et cetera, et cetera. So it's one problem that solves a couple problems at once. I look for solutions like that. I, um, one of the, so I'll give you another example from my own life. Um, even though this is purely anecdotal, but it, it's, uh, it gives you a way to think about this. I look, for example, I, I have a dog, right? I have to hike my dog every day. I try to combine hiking uphill, wearing a weight vest, so and hiking uphill because that's exercise and I'm, you know, working leg strength and all that other stuff uh, with a hike in nature, which lowers cortisol levels and provides a 20 minute walk in the woods, essentially provides the same benefits as most of the SSRIs on the market and kind of increasing serotonin levels, increasing calm. So I, you know, uh, and in flow you need a release activity right there's a flow cycle and the second stage of the flow cycle is release and usually a low-grade physical exercise works great for that so the way i stack my morning i have a big riding session followed by a dog hike the dog hike is going to be my release session so if i was stuck in flow i was stuck while riding this will be released and maybe it'll kick me into flow for my next riding session it will also the walk in nature will calm me down and I'll get some exercise. It's a very personal example, but it's a multi-tool solution for my own life. And I got to hike my dog anyways. So I'm doing something I automatically have to do. And I get to layer three other things that would normally be separate items on my to-do list on top of one thing. So that's a multi-tool solution. So when you have children, when you have a crazy busy schedule, when you're doing a million things at once, I always want to look for ways for stacking protocols, multi-tool solutions, and especially if you're dealing with a very hectic life, these short pauses and momentary resets can, can sometimes really matter. Alicia asked if you can define burnout. So the, the definition mm. of burnout that we use in Zero to Dangerous, which is from the World Health Organization, is that burnout is a prolonged response to chronic emotional and interpersonal stressors on the job and, and the key part of this definition is that it's defined across three dimensions the first of which is exhaustion uh, the second of which is cynicism and detachment and then the third of which is low self-efficacy which is a sense of ineffectiveness and lack of accomplishment and then uh, amina made a great point about bore out which is occurring more and more and had occurred through the pandemic uh, adam grant wrote an article about flow and languishing where he referenced that 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 is a great article for people to check out bore out is is you know likely seeing one of those dimensions of burnout happening such as the overwhelming exhaustion without you know the full picture kicking into gear and that that definitely can happen with the amount of online work that the people are engaging with there's been a bunch of questions on breath work and cortisol levels so I know you've looked at this. I'll, I'll talk about it really quickly. I also, uh, there, are, there are a lot of sort of really excellent people on this topic. Uh, Dr. Andrew Uberman is, is, is particularly good on, on breath work, I think. And uh, his stuff is, is really worth listening to. Some really simple things with breath work. So interestingly, flow does not just mean all the cortisol out of your system. Cortisol is underpins the, the sympathetic nervous system, your fight and flight response. And there's your parasympathetic, which is rest and relax uh, mode. And in flow, we actually see both systems active at once. So you have a little bit of cortisol in your system and a little bit of the rest and relax chemicals. And it 
Usually when this happens, when you get two systems active at once, and this is actually fairly common uh, in, in biology and in, in neuroscience, it's precision tuning. So it's like on a, on a hi-fi and a stereo, when you have a bass and a treble, it's easier to tune your stereo than if you just have one knob, right? So same thing if you have activity in the parasympathetic and the sympathetic at the same time. If you want to balance parasympathetic and sympathetic activity, it's really easy. Five second inhale, 10 second exhale, or five second inhale, five second exhale, that will balance it. I tend to like using, uh, I will take my inhale, uh, you want to obviously breathe in diaphragmatically, so starting deep into the belly and then filling up the lungs, going up to the top of the lungs um, that way. And that's one simple thing. Dr. Huberman also recommends, and this is the, one of the fastest ways to sort of drop cortisol levels and norepinephrine levels, is you do a long inhale and then you do a second inhale on top of it. So take in the first inhale, I'll, I'll do it for you. It's. So you take in as much as air as you possibly can, and then you suck in more air. And what that essentially does is it forces you into rest and relax mode. And then you do, once you've taken that air and you, you let it out, often uh, a lot of people like to do it out loud. So a loud exhale with their mouth. I like to do it with my nose and exhale long and slow that way. But usually if you're doing... I can usually calm, start calming myself down within two breaths using that technique and 10 to 15 breaths will really get me back. So if you're, if you're looking for fast ways to calm down through breath work, uh, those are the ones I meant, I want to mention before we go into the grit story. And Rian, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll just set up the context. So, uh, Steve, myself and you were in, uh, we actually, we both always, uh, always mix up the the city. It was either Helsinki or Stockholm. Um, one of the two, we had two trips within a short period of time. I believe this was in Helsinki and, uh, and you were, you were opening for Obama in front of almost 8,000 European CEOs. So a huge percentage of, of CEOs of big European companies were there and it's, enormous stadium there's photos of it i think on our on our website and you were opening for obama and uh yeah things got a little bit mixed up with respect to the the time allocation oh yeah this was about speech so yeah this is a so this was uh one of the levels of grit we like to talk about is the grit to be your best when you're at your worst and the example i like to give with this one is when I write a new speech, whenever I give a speech, I like to, you know, I'll, I'll write it, I'll run it a couple of times. I usually do it in front of, you know, a friend or two. And then I, I don't consider a speech like locked and done and loaded unless what I like to do is I like to find a day when I didn't get enough sleep the night before. So I, I didn't get an active recovery session and I didn't recover well. I'm like I said, I've worked all day and then I'll go to the gym, work out really hard. I'll come home. I'll grab my dogs and we'll go up one. I, I live in the mountains, so we'll go up one of the mountains uh, behind my house and I'll give the speech then. And if I can give the speech on uh, no sleep after working a full day while exhausted, while heading up a mountain, I feel like I can give the speech under any circumstances. And you're giving this example, right? It was, I think it was, yeah, I can't remember if we, where we were. I think it was Finland, but I cannot actually remember. Um, I remember it was like 25,000 people in the auditorium and another like 50,000 people on, on the live feed. It was that huge room. And they had been very persnickety because I was opening for Obama. Uh, the timing was very critical. And they had, they had asked me specifically to write a, a speech that was, I think, 27 minutes and 30 seconds long. And right before I was supposed to go on stage, the event organizer was backstage with me and he was about to let me on stage. He was super nervous. He was really scared. He was, it was a big event for him. And as, as Rian pointed out, there were all these CEOs in the audience. And I looked at him, I was like, you can calm down, take a deep breath. I got this. I worked with your people. Don't worry, it's 27 minutes and 30 seconds on the nose. I got you. And he eyes pop and he looks at me and goes, oh my God, they didn't tell you we need it to be 23 minutes and 16 seconds. And by the way, you're on in five, four, three. And 
he put me on stage and it was uh it was a speech for my book bold too which was of all my books bold is the hardest book to talk about quickly because there's the ideas are really really big and they don't summarize very quickly and so i had to give a bold speech and i had to cut i think five minutes and 15 seconds off of it in real time on stage um, out of a out of a speech that's hard to make sense out of even at at, at normal length, um, and I was opening for Obama, so uh, I did it. It actually worked incredibly well. Uh, but that, like, one of the reasons, sort of, you want the grit, uh, you want it, the grit to be your best when you're at your worst, is when those situations arise, when you actually have trained yourself to be gritty in those situations. You can actually, I actually, I remember when I was walking on stage at that point, because when I was backstage, there was, you know, I was nervous to begin with because it was a big room and it, it was the president. And I remember he, you know, there was a moment of absolute panic when he said that to me. And as I walked on stage, there was this familiarity of, oh, wait, I, you know, yes, there's a lot of people, but I've been here before. I've done this before. And I've had to cut time out of a speech before live. And okay, let's figure this out. And it, uh, it actually turned out to be a lot of fun. But it's one of the reasons I think it's so important to kind of train, uh, train your best, to train to be your best when you're at your worst. Because oftentimes when those situations arise, they're big moments, right? Like I'm, the only time in my career I've opened for a president. I don't know if that's going to happen again. You know, it's a big moment. It, you you want to get it right. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great example of us. Uh, I'm going to take a few questions here, Stephen, from people who have been submitting them. So uh, AJ says, what if the goal is to develop a habit or personality trait, which requires continuous effort? Um, and I'm assuming what he means there is how, how do you think about setting a goal like that maybe it's the same as the breakdown you already gave um it's a great question the one thing that i want to emphasize here a little counterintuitive but any kind of habit formation is it's learning it's a, this is a learning process right and learning like habit formation requires recovery requires gaps uh in between in fact uh the research shows by the way do an intense learning session or try to lay in your your new habit and uh then a short yoga nidra session sort of an alpha wave meditation um afterwards uh is fantastic for cementing learning also a, a good night's sleep because most of that takes place in deep delta waves uh, sleep. So my, my point in all this is it, the, from the sounds of the question, sounds like you're going after something hard and chewy that's going to take a lot of work. And I think this is when, when I hear questions like this, and, and please correct me in the chat if I'm wrong or if I'm overstating or I'm being presumptuous. Um, but when I hear questions like that, I, I you know, I think you're, I, I, I'm worried you're going a little too hard and not realizing you don't, you're not going to get there overnight. Habit formation is, is slow, it's steady, and it's a little bit every day or a little bit at a time, not in all in all the time. I think that ends up ending up being demotivating. You go really hard for a while and then you're just totally burned out and, and you go away. I'd rather go a little bit at a time and be slow and steady and sort of bring these new habits into my life that way. Um, Cause what, you know, I, I tend to think about things in five year chunks. How will my life be different if I learn this thing, you know, now or start working on this thing now, even if it takes me five years, because some stuff does. And I just, you know, I'm a slow learner and I want to give myself time. Maybe I'll get there quicker, but, you know, I, I, I try to, I try to uh, be that way. And by the way, people have been asking uh, which books of mine to start with, what to do. Um, I don't really have a primer for you. But I can tell you that West of Jesus looks at the neuroscience of mystical experience and kind of the overlay between flow and spirituality. This idea gets continued in Stealing Fire, a book I wrote with Jamie Wheel. The core flow text, the core peak performance text, Art of Impossible, uh, Rise of Superman and Art of Impossible 
if you're interested in the work I've sort of done around flow and business and disruptive technology, abundance, bold, futures faster than you think. Um, and then there's some books on humans and animals and some novels in there, but we won't confuse things. <laughs> Soon I got another question here from Scott Roscos. He says, do you think it's possible to undermine our brain's trust or confidence in our decisions or goals? I ask as someone who frequently worked to the point of burnout and sickness, and now I have almost a PTSD that's related to goals. I don't think you're alone here. I, first of all, I've, I've, we hear this a lot in people we, we, we get to work with because we work with a lot of you know, peak performers and, uh, and you know, we work with a lot of executives. And I would say that some significant portion of our clientele are C-suite executives, uh, men and women, by the way, uh, and, and usually just so you guys know, I think, I don't know what the breakdown is. I think more than 50% of the people we, we work with tend to be women. Um, so uh, it is in gender wise, it's an equal ratio, but everybody comes in and one of the most common complaints is, is simply this is like, wow, I have, I've, I've gritted, I've been so gritty and have worked so hard towards my goals that I'm now a little phobic setting them because I end up driving myself straight into burnout. And for this, I would, you know, to, to sort of talk about this, I think, you know, I want to emphasize a couple of things that are important in, in burnout protocols. And I think this is really important in grid and goal setting. So, so one of the things that we talk about a lot when we talk about preventing burnout or, you know, other things is there's an order with, with peak performance uh, should be trained. I'm hesitant to use a word like should, but what I mean by this is I, we, I've maintained for a very long time that peak performance is nothing more or nothing less than getting our, our biology to work for us rather than against us. And in the art of impossible, there's an order. I start with intrinsic motivation, then I move into goal setting, then I move into grit. What happens when you do this out of order? What happens if you just try to be gritty all the time is you end up burned out. And one of the, one of the things that I emphasize a lot is we all have what's known as a primary flow activity. This is whatever you've done since you were a little kid that, you know, 80, 90% of the time it drops you into flow. For me, it's skiing for, you know, some people it's dancing salsa for my wife. It's um, walking in the mountains with, with our dogs. For some people it's gardening. For some people it's playing with their children. It's on and on and on. But what tends to happen as we get more responsible in life is we set aside childish things. We stop skiing. We stop hiking in the mountains. We stop doing our primary flow activity and double down on the, our grit, our goals and things we want to accomplish. And what I, I always tend to say that grit without flow is, is burnout. It's just, it's, it will, you'll end up just having what we heard about from AJ, which is like goal related PTSD. Um, it, and the, one of the reasons that your primary flow activity is so important, especially in this conversation is when we drop into flow, a couple of things happen. There's been an ongoing conversation in the chat about cortisol levels. So as we move into flow, stress hormones, predominantly cortisol get flushed out of our system and they get replaced by positive feel good neurochemicals, dopamine, serotonin, and andamine and so forth. And we're resetting our nervous system back to zero. So you're calming back down. First thing. Second thing, flow is a focusing skill. It's just as mindfulness is a focusing skill. Flow is a different kind of focus. And the more flow you get, the more flow you get. So if I go skiing on Monday, and I go to work on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you know, skiing and getting into flow on Monday is going to help me get into flow Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, because I'm training my brain to, on to focus. I've also sort of reset my nervous system and recharge my battery and flow because it's the source code of intrinsic motivation. It feels amazing. It sort of pays off the grit, right? Flow is the re getting to be in flow is one of the reasons all that grit is so worthwhile. So one of the things when I, this may not be the answer that AJ was looking for, that's what sort of came to mind when he asked the question.
Super. That's great. Thanks. So this is from Matthew Halma. He says, uh-huh. when, we t- when we talk about goal setting, mostly the orientation is towards our professional life or career. How does goal setting differ for personal projects or even fuzzier areas like relationships or spirituality? I see. I don't tend to set as many professional goals as I think most people. They, there tends not to be a lot. Um, for example, writing to me is a spiritual practice. Whatever we mean by spirituality, that 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 connection to something greater than myself, my one of the ways in for me into that is writing. So I have a really hard time separating out those things. And I don't so I don't tend to think about professional goals versus personal goals versus spiritual goals, because in the way I tend to do things, they end up laying on top of each other. That's not an answer to your question. That's just why I paused and when I was thinking about it, what I would like to sort of point out about um, especially personal goals, and, and I'm not 100% certain what you mean by spiritual goals, but let me let me take a swing at both. Um, I think what's easier with professional goals is we have a really clear cut answer. Did I reach them? Did I not? Right? Like, One of my ongoing personal goals is I, you know, I'd like to figure, I'd like to find a way to, you know, constantly be a better husband than I was last year, right? My wife and I have been together, I think it's 17 years, and I still feel like I'm figuring out how to be married, how to be a good husband, how to be, you know, all those things. Um, That is an amorphous sort of uh, personal goal and, um, I, how to benchmark progress on that is is a little trickier. And one of the things that I tend to think of with sort of spiritual goals and personal goals and those things is exactly this question, how do you benchmark progress? And one of the reasons they're harder is we don't have, so Rian emphasized at the start of this podcast, if you're making a uh, clear goals list, make them clear, make them clear, make them clear, make them clear until they're so written out that your brain just knows exactly what to do at all times. You might want to try that with your spiritual goals and your personal goals is really chunk them down. I'll give you an example. I would like to be a better husband. For example, that's a very amorphous kind of personal goal. Um, I would like to find five things my wife does every day to try to celebrate. By the way, if I tried to celebrate five things about my wife every day, she would start throwing pots and pans at me. Um, It would be too much overload. She'd be like, what have you done with my husband? But that's the kind of thing where you you want to take the personal goal or behavioral goal and chunk it into things that you can actually sort of measure. I hope that's helpful. And um, I may not be, by the way, I may not be the best guy in the world to ask about spiritual goals. I, you know, I try to stay in my lane and my lane tends to be science driven peak performance. I don't necessarily think I'm, you know, anybody, but another guy with just an opinion about uh, questions around spirituality. So I I would like to point that out also. Well, I I think it's a great and important point, um, Stephen, that when you access flow very significantly through your professional pursuits, they start to blur into spiritual pursuits because of the fact that there are, you know, key characteristics of flow that people report as being spiritual experiences. Mm-hmm. So that it, it all starts to become one thing. Julia, this relates to some of the topics that we've touched on before. So Julie Greenwald says, Stephen, you've mentioned both the autonomic nervous system and your challenges with patients. I was wondering, do you think there is a direct <laughs> correlation between losing your patients and getting frustrated by a situation and the sympathetic nervous system? Yes. I mean, for me, yes. Um, the line between, I have a particularly bad reaction to uh powerlessness right i can't no matter what i do i can't change this thing and that tends to be sort of when i lose my patience and um and mind you uh, you know the context i've been working on on big sort of environmental challenges and big environmental challenges in, in my experience 
Um, they require nothing more than than patience and toleration, tolerance for sort of going one inch at a time. And it uh, it just does sort of, um, I think what ends up happening for me when I ultimately lose it, right, the overwhelm that rises up, the frustration that rises up, that's a fight or flight response. It's a, I'm overwhelmed. I can no longer juggle all these things. I can no longer hold this all in my head. And I can no longer, once I'm overwhelmed, right? One of the things that you have to, it's helpful to understand here is that the brain will panic. The brain will trigger a fight or flight response, a strong sympathetic response if it feels like you don't have the resources to meet the challenge. It doesn't matter if the challenge is sort of small, your brain is gonna turn a small work problem into a catastrophe if you don't have the resources to meet the challenge. This is sort of what the same thing that happens in burnout because you're tired all the time, your fear levels are really jacked up, right? When you're tired all the time, you don't have enough energy to meet the day's challenges. So anything that's a little bit frustrating can easily be overwhelming and you can get that fast sympathetic response thank you all so much have a phenomenal 2022 and that was failure to finisher and hopefully see you inside zero to dangerous thank thanks everyone great questions and comments i i hope we were useful and uh have a amazing 2022 and we'll catch you a little later in the year If what you've heard on Flow Research Collective Radio has been helpful, please consider doing us a solid and leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to this. Reviews help us connect to a wider audience so we can get these peak performance principles out to more people.